Okay, that's a good start. So thanks, Gavin, and, and thanks, Anthemis. Uh, I've had a relationship with, uh, with Anthemis since actually before Tinder, uh, for at least six years, uh, and it has been a uh, really, really fantastic uh, relationship. So it's exciting to be at the front of the room uh, when I used to sit uh, at one of the back tables listening. So uh, you know, big thanks to Jan and uh, Sean and everybody uh, at Anthemis. Um, so I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes um, on uh, AI, the structure of the talk is really right at the beginning, let's just kind of identify some general principles, then we can dive into some examples. But these things are often better through Q&A because it's such a huge subject. And, and I've got to learn it as a huge subject uh, following a really a 10 or 12 years since I first got involved in a company doing it AI. It's longer than that, it's about 15 years. Um, and, and a couple of years ago, I started a newsletter that looked at some of the more macroscopic impacts of technologies like AI, which you can sign up to at this URL, azim.io slash s, but I see some subscribers around the table, so if you haven't, Anne and uh, Jan told everybody here about it, you should have done it, um, but you can sign up for it. So one of the, 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 the big starting points is why would uh, AI be interesting to us as a, uh, as a species, um, and the, the real reason is that there are only three ways for us to get smarter. So one is through the process of evolution, one is through the use of genetic engineering, uh, and the third is by using artificial intelligence. So one of those takes a really, really long time, uh, and in our impatient way, we're, we're not ready for it. The second is kind of risky uh, right now, um, and so that leaves the third, most, the third one being artificial intelligence as the most promising way for us to think about how we improve ourselves and get smarter. And, and getting smarter is really the key to all of this, because once you get smarter, you can start to solve new classes of problems and you can start to create and imagine new possibilities. And what's been happening with AI is that it's had this really long uh, gestation. Uh, the, the term emerged about 60 years ago at a conference in Dartmouth, Dartmouth University where a group of computer scientists and psychologists and engineers and mathematicians got together. They coined the term artificial intelligence. And they said that you know, AI would be the, a technology that would allow computer systems to behave quite human-like. And they figured that they were about 10 years away from achieving this. Uh, and so, Q 50 years, we're now about 20 or 30 years away from achieving this. And it's been much tougher than we thought. But in the last three to four years, this has been inescapable. What's come to the public for has been this idea that AI is now starting to become real and something that companies can, can use. And so here's a, a statement from Andrew Ning, who's uh, now a senior, uh, runs the AI activities at Baidu, the Chinese internet company. And Andrew is one of the top four or five AI researchers academically who have really put a lot of these techniques on the map in the last few years. And he says that pretty much anything that a normal person can now do in less than one second, we can now automate with AI. Uh, and that's quite powerful as a, as a frame. When you present this to engineers, by the way, in Silicon Valley, the first thing they try to do is think of all the things we can do in one second that, that AI can't yet do, blowing your nose being, being one of them. Uh, but if you, uh, if you look at the, this idea and start to apply that to your businesses as a lens or a frame, which is where are their tasks that take less than a second? Frankly, some tasks take more than a second. Those should be potentially automatable. So we get into this definitional challenge, uh, which is, what is AI? Uh, needless to say, with all the money coming into it and all the job opportunities, extracting that label is really valuable for people, meaning making it less valuable for the rest of us. So a framework that I use is, um, it, is this one, that you know, AI is this umbrella term. And at its highest level, AI is about getting computers to handle novel situations that they haven't seen before in some reasonable way and to learn from their experience. Because that's kind of what, what uh, intelligence is, right? Intelligence is about being able to direct yourself at a goal and assign and align your resources to achieve that goal. And ideally you should be able to state what that goal is or choose a new goal. Um, in, in AI parlance, we break that out into sort of three categories, right? So we have 
Um, the stuff that makes newspaper headlines is Stephen Hawking stuff, artificial superintelligence. So these are uh, AI systems that are more powerful than humans that will either be sort of demons of our own design or angels of our better nature, uh, either Terminator or the, land, the, the path to uh, uh, unending milk and honey. We're quite far away from ASI. Um, in the middle is what we call AGI, or Artificial General Intelligence, which is human-ish levels of intelligence. And it's what the likes of Apple and Google would like to persuade you that we have through Google Now and Siri and so on. But even that ability to build an AI system that is as competent or remotely as competent as a human across a wide range of domains is, is quite far away. And the final area where we are making lots of progress would be ANI, Artificial Narrow Intelligence. So can we define these computer systems that are supremely brilliant at very, very narrow domains? A great example is what Google DeepMind did with Go. So they built a computer called AlphaGo that can play this, this game Go better than a human, um, but it can't open the door. So it's artificial narrow intelligence in, in the real world, kind of not, not great. But within that context, you've got um, AI as this umbrella term, and you've probably heard lots of these, these different terms. I'm just going to kind of walk them through. So the, the, the red blob is um, this idea of uh, uh, kind of these rule-based systems like um, expert systems and natural language processing. These are sort of symbolic approaches towards uh, solving the intelligence problem. Um, and in the green blob are these statistical ways of solving the intelligence problem. Basically, gigantic, amazing linear regressions of the times the types that we've used for ages. Um, and two that stand out, one is this idea of machine learning. In my previous company, and this portfolio company, Peer Index, used machine learning extensively. And in recent years, this new technique called deep learning. Just out of interest, how many people here have heard of the term deep learning? Okay, so it's kind of 90%. And how many people would feel comfortable standing in front of a room of 100 people and explaining. <laughs> okay. Great, so we've got a few. That's, that's great, but I think that, that's my point about like, these things getting into the public domain early. And, and then at the top lobby, you've got this general idea of, 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 of AI. And when I talk about AI, I kind of talk about all of these things because it's sort of easier than getting into a definitional, um, a definitional fight. So just to put the best line up front, so you can kind of go back and relax, um, three key implications of AI within financial services. So the first is better, cheaper predictions. So essentially deep learning is really good at mapping high dimensional complex spaces and building predictors. So what, what should I do next, or what does this look like? Uh, much better than many other things that we have. So anything that involves predictions, so whether it's risk management, or it's trading, or it's advising, or it's KYC, is this person really who they say they are, or if it's credit assessments, um, we're going to get uh, much, much higher quality and essentially falling to the price of zero. The second is the automation of human tasks, which uh, in certain narrow domains we can now start to do, whether it's customer service or back office processes. Those are things that we will be able to automate at quite fast rate. And I'll give you an example. I was with the founder of a chat um, bot system that uses a bunch of AI technologies to create human-like chatbots. Um, he had customers where 90 to 95% of their customer services queries could be handled end-to-end -end on, on an AI-powered chatbot. And the third area is product innovation. So there's going to be new products and new markets that will open up. Um, new products because the rate of innovation increases, new markets because there are things that we wouldn't have been able to accurate, risks we wouldn't have been able to accurately price that we can now price because we've got better maths coming up here. And so, in a sense, new source of alpha, that's a metaphorical marketer's alpha, by the way, it's not sort of stock market alpha, it just means advantage, um, is better cheap predictions means that what's going to matter is judgment, predictions are free. Automation of human tasks means that what will matter will be experience and intimacy. And product innovation increasing will mean that you need to do one of two things, either be super agile uh, or the, uh, the businessman's old favorite, build a monopoly. Uh, so it doesn't matter how much the agile is. And, and it's important to understand that within the context of AI and the under, underlying algorithms that drive them, the rate of improvement is really, really significant. 
So we had a 10 or 12 year period where we weren't really making a huge amount of non-linear improvement uh, in, in machine learning performance. And then we had this breakthrough three or four years ago. But what's happened since then is this incredible pace of improvement. This chart um, shows the performance of generalized AIs playing video games, which I know sounds silly, but it's quite an important thing. And essentially shows what the improvement over 12 months was. So at the start of the observation period, half of the time that AIs played these video games, they were performing at a subhuman level, about as well as I played them. Um, and, and a quarter of the time, superhuman, quarter of the time human. As we improved things, researchers downloaded code and tweaked parameters and tried new approaches. Over the course of 12 months, the proportion that became subhuman was only a third, and about half became human level performance. So what you're seeing is this radical improvement in our ability to handle these quite complex tasks. And that's going to, that's going to continue. I was with the, um, somebody from, uh, from OpenAI, which is a, a, an AI research group funded by Elon Musk and, and Russell Buckley. Uh, Russell Buckley, not Russell Buckley, he's my old board director. Reid Hoffman, uh, uh, on Thursday. And we were talking about, you know, how can you keep up with reading the AI papers that are being published? And he was like, I have no idea how you keep up. There are just so many being published every day. Uh, and that's a fundamental indicator of the rate of improvement. And so, to give you a sense of this, there are lots of domains which were human domains where AIs are now better than humans. Um, and this is looking at video game performance. Uh, oh, this is a, a, a year-old slide from Google DeepMind. 100% uh, baseline there is human performance. So woe betide anyone who plays DeepMind at video pinball or breakout or star gunner. You're going to be eviscerated. Uh, this was not possible to do this in a generalized way three or four years ago. And, and to give you another example, these things are now <coughs> able to look at scenes like this and describe what's going on. Again, this is, this is a one-year-old slide. I've actually given up trying to keep my slides up to date because um, this thing moves too fast. But this uh, combination of two neural networks, a convolutional neural network and a recurrent neural network, generates this caption. A group of people shopping at an outdoor market, there are many vegetables at the fruit stand. There's only one mistake there, right? Because it's not a fruit stand, it's a vegetable stand. Uh, but that's as good as human, and that would have been pretty much magic if you'd been able to do that 10 years ago, uh, your translation. So one of the industry dynamics has been that the major uh, internet companies are moving into AI significantly. So Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon, and to a certain extent, Baidu are really leading this charge. And they've done two things. One is that they have released their internal machine learning and AI frameworks. Almost certainly not their best frameworks, and almost certainly not what they're using in production, but really, really good frameworks, and things that are jaw-droppingly better than most of the things that we will have in our companies. And more recently, they have all released these high-level machine learning as a service and AI as a service APIs. So you can go out and rent Capacity. So if you want to build an AI bot with natural language understanding that can interface with a human in 20 languages, you can go to Amazon and for a few cents per transaction, they will rent that capability <coughs> to you to deliver a service. And, and that has led to this industry dynamic um, that suggests that this might be a big dog's game um, for a bunch of reasons. And, and you know, it does AI systems seem to favor the large. Um, and I'll just go through each of those. So the first challenge is that Modern AI systems and machine learning really, really improves with scale. Uh, you need lots and lots of data, and, and even in systems that don't need much data, giving them more data will always help. So there was a, a, a research paper which is very accessible called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data, written by Peter Norvig from Google, which you can go and read. But since that time, many of the new techniques like deep learning just consume data like nobody's business. Right, so when I was building Peer Index, and we, you know, we did most of our algorithmic work in 2012-13, the techniques we were using would sort of stop <clears> getting better once you reached you know, hundreds of gigabytes of training data that you've given, given to them. And these new techniques, these deep neural networks, which have many more parameters, you can give them a thousand times as much data and more, and they will just get better and better performance, to the point that on things like captioning images or translating text, or transcribing text, the computers are now better than humans uh, in a wide, wide range of varieties. The second is that 
actually the cost of building these systems is quite significant. So when you build your first machine learning system and you, 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 you train it to make some predictions, you have to run a training process. And training costs used to be quite cheap. So we used to go off and train things that cost us like $5,000. Um, to, to do that, then we can apply that algorithm you know, thousands of times a minute. Um, these new systems that I'm seeing come out in, in the academic papers have often got training costs running, if you, if you bought them in the market from, say, Amazon, running into the hundreds of thousands of dollars of computational time. So it's now not actually that cheap. It's not a case of just getting a few CPUs. You actually have, to have quite a big rig and, and, and so on. And so that is, can be a blocker unless you're really willing to make that commitment. Um, and the final thing is hiring the right talent. Um, these skills are quite hard to find. Uh, experience skills are hard to find. And setting up the, the kind of operational and cultural parameters that allow people building in this space to do their work well is really quite difficult. Um, so all of that tends to favor some of the existing large, large companies. But then that sort of asks a big question, which is why has there been such a huge explosion in investment in, uh, in, in AI um, over the last few years? And you can see the chart. I mean, we're up to $2.5 billion invested in early stage in 2015. And I think we were at the similar sort of level after six months this year. Um, and the reason is that, that if you can succeed in building AI systems, you build a really defensible business on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, if you don't build them, you're going to be out of business. So the, the dynamics here are what I call the AI lock-in loop. Uh, and the lock-in loop uh, runs like this, that if you think that some kind of AI system can improve your product, and you build it, and it does improve your product, that improved product generates more usage. And that increasing usage generates you more data that you haven't seen previously. And that data improves your AI, <coughs> which in turn improves your product which improves your data, and so on. And then the second part of that loop is that as you improve your product, if you've got a decent business model, which most people in this room have, but can't be said for all consumer internet companies, um, it, it should increase your profits, which you can invest in improving your AI or you know, other competitive advantages. What we see across industries is that because of these dynamics, when AI gets into a sector, you can't then compete without it. And it first happened with first-person video games, it then went on to web search. Uh, you know, Google was the 15th, 20th web search engine, but it most used uh, machine learning well with its sort of uh, network analytics. And now you couldn't imagine launching web search that didn't use some of these machine learning or deep learning capabilities. User interface, mobile user interface, you couldn't launch one without having a, uh, a, a sort of a voice understanding system. And so we're now starting to see in every sector, whether it's healthcare or finance or defense, the importance of building some sort of AI system that takes advantage of this kind of loop. Um, but in the finance space, machine learning isn't new. Just a quick, anyone recognize who this chap is? Yeah? Jim Simmons, he's done all right, hasn't he? 80% annual return for the last 28 years, uh, which is all right, um, I think. Uh, and you know what we know about Jim is that he went out and hired scientists, not financiers, who were really good at st computational statistics. And he's essentially, with this closed fund, the Medallion Fund, returned 80% year on year for nearly three decades. So it's not new in the finance industry. And we're now starting to see quite a range of companies bringing AI uh, into fintech. Um, and, and what you'll see is actually there's quite a wide, wide variety. Um, so you've got the kind of credit scoring people. Um, Air, I'm sure many of you know. I can't remember if Air is an Anthemis company, isn't it? No, it should be. Um, uh, you've got the quantitative trading people. You've got the bots and assistants. We'll chat, chat about Clio a bit later. Um, sentiment analysis, kind of interesting. Um, and then you've got some people work doing stuff in predictive analytics. And actually what's missing in some of this area is um, companies that are not dedicated to the, to the finance vertical who are building technologies that are particularly relevant, whether it's fraud detection or uh, text understanding. Um, and and you know, I talked about this earlier, but the, the Q3 2016 um, FinTech fundraising was about $2.4 billion. 
Um, so it's still growing very, very fast. When we think about what the benefits are for, uh, for people in the finance sector, I mean, I highlighted the big three at the, at the top, but I'll just go into a bit more detail. So the first one is kind of faster actions and decisions. Um, and you know, fraud detection is, is one. Um, I'm just going through a remortgage at the moment. I mean, it's incredibly painful. I'm into week 11 uh, of this process. Um, better outcomes for things like portfolio optimization. I mean, lots of our, having worked a little bit with risk modeling, um, not much, but a little, I was surprised at how antiquated the approaches were in finance compared to the way the statistics that's used within in consumer internet companies. Um, you know, greater efficiency uh, is a key part about the shift away from using labor to using capital. Um, and there's a, you know, we've talked about innovation. I'll dig into some of these as we run through some examples. Um, but then there are three kind of key challenges for especially incumbents within, within fintech, set aside those benefits. So the first is the, the, you know, the challenge of, of automation. And automation sounds really great. I'm sure some of you have seen a picture of the, there was a picture that went around the internet recently of a trading floor in 1995 and the same trading floor in 2015. And in 2015 it's empty and in 1995 it's kind of full of traders. You know, automation is great because it can reduce your costs significantly, um, but it also has issues because of, you know, what happens to your to the handling of those um, that change, right? The I know bank, banks are often pretty unemotional about headcount reductions, uh, but there there could be quite a lot, and it might start to also change fundamentally the cultural architecture that lives within a bank. The second is competition. Uh, because there will be a, a range of new competitors. So this is not just the sort of challenger banks, of whom I know we've got quite a lot here, but it's the nipping away of different areas where banks have traditionally been, been working. Um, and one of them actually is just in the ability to better understand what risk is, right? Because at some fundamental level, machine learning is super accurate regression. So it should be able to price risk really, really well. And therefore, people might not... You know, you might, you might as a bank or as a market maker or somebody moving risk around not have all the information and your, your, your client may have more than you and that may affect your business. Um, and then the final one is this area of cascading failure, which I think is, is quite interesting. So that's this idea of flash crashes, so poorly designed automated systems that interact with each other and then do bad things. Uh, and at some point, I would expect regulators to be tougher about those sorts of things and about who should carry the can for poorly designed systems within a, uh, parts of the system. So there are a few challenges to play out with. Okay, so that's a bit miserable. Um, uh, just some, some data on how your colleagues think about this. Um, so it says within 15 years, 68% of people in the industry expect to complete or substantial change to their own jobs. Um, so my two thoughts on that is that 15 years and 68% doesn't feel quite right. I mean, I think 15 years is sufficiently long for that number to be much higher. Yeah. Um, and by complete or substantial change, yeah, they, if they mean losing their jobs, um, then that's probably also right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna run through, um, Gavin, five minutes more? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, great. So let me run through just some, uh, some use cases uh, and, and one of them that I think is quite interesting that I'm not going to talk about, but I'm happy, happy to, is KYC and AML, uh, because I know it's not super sexy, um, but, but I think it's, it's one of those areas where the process could become better, faster for the end user, and also reduce the risk that you, that you face when you kind of go and step through that process. Um, so trading is, uh, is particularly interesting. Um, you know, algo trading has grown really, really significantly. I mean, when I first dealt with algo trading in 2006, 2007, that was really, by the way, a bad time to get involved in investing in 2007, uh, was, you know, algo trading was quite small and the people running systematic uh, trading firms had to explain what the hell it is they did. Uh, and the most we were doing was sort of, you know, VWAP, like, which is kind of dumb. Um, and, and or some, some sort of statistical arbitrage or, or something like that. 
Um, and of course, it doesn't make sense in a, in a world where anything a, com a human can do in less than one second, a computer can do better and for free, uh, for, for trading to stay with, um, uh, you know, with humans. The, the other area is um, in robo-advising. So this is another key, key issue where if you think back to kind of portfolio theory and it's all about all your returns are from your asset allocation, right, fundamentally. Uh, and then you, you take some punts on specific stock picks and even more punts on the timing. Um, this is exactly the sort of thing that plays really, really well to the kind of statistics in machine learning. Out of interest, is anyone here running a robo-advisor? Yeah. Good choice. Yeah. I mean, your challenge is, of course, that, that, that are, you, are you an incumbent or a startup? Right. So your challenge will be that, you know, it's now like the CSFBs and all the people with distribution can build these things quite a lot easier. So you, you have that tension as to whether you've got a permanent foothold. Okay, so you're, you're arming the arms, right? Um, so the other area is, is in hedge funds, and I'm going to pick up on, on a couple of trading um, calls. So this, this fund, um, ADIA, is quite interesting. The bit that I found particularly uh, nice was... Uh, if you look at the market return, which is this, it's so much more volatile than their own return. Uh, now, that's not always what you want to, to look for, but you can just generate better sort of statistical outcomes, in other words, return profiles, uh, using these, this new maths. And one of the algorithmic <coughs> trading funds I was involved in was actually quite different because it was a long vol fund, and, and but it moved in the opposite direction <coughs> to the market. Um, so just, just to think about... What this means identifies and executes trades entirely on its own. Um, it means technically um, a lower cost to the customer. Of course, it doesn't mean that. It means a high return to the person owning the fund. Uh, but uh, it's nice to know. Um, but it also means that, that you should be able to be much more um, predictive about how this fund is going to perform. The one that really gets, uh, I find super interesting is Numerai. Um, so, has anyone come across Numerai? <clears throat> yeah, a few people. So these guys are really, really, really interesting. What they've gone off and done is they've said, um, we can't, uh, we, we think the wisdom of the crowds is a much better way to generate um, trading outcomes. Uh, and by inventing some kind of encryption and anonymization technology, they let lots and lots of people feed their models and effectively they get to back test across billions and billions of predictions. Um, and too late, by the way, to invest because one of the Rentec founders and a couple of New York VCs um, have gone into uh, Numerai. Uh, the customer service and retail <coughs> banks is an interesting area. There's a, uh, there's a service that actually I've been using um, called Clio, which is a London-based service. And what's really nice about Clio, just from a kind of sense of financial intelligence and financial well-being, is that it interacts with me through Facebook Messenger. So on a Monday morning, Clio sends me a message and say, hey, Azim, we've got your spending from last week, and here's your, your top 10, here's your bank's the bank balance. I'm always in Facebook Messenger, right? So because a lot of people message me, so I have that to hand. I don't have to fire up a new app and, and so on. So this is quite an interesting space because Yogi Berra style, was it, was it the Yogi Berra line, why do you rob banks? Because that's where all the money is. Um, Clio comes to where I am. So I'm going to wrap on some, some challenges for, uh, for people in the finance sector, which I put into two areas, opportunity identification and ethical execution. As this is financial services, I'll explain what I mean by the word ethical. Uh, so so uh, how do you identify the opportunities? Because there are so many opportunities. How do you build the capabilities and culture? You know, your cultures in general have been ones of risk management and control and regulation. A lot of these new opportunities are in the innovation space, the exploration space, the uncertain return space, the things might go wrong space. So that's quite a tension, unless of course you're in a hedge fund, in which case you should be fine there. Um, how to manage business model changes is going to be a big issue because you might either have one level channel conflict or you may just fundamentally have something that runs completely counter to the way you've been making money. Um, this question about how to deal with humans in an increasingly automated world uh, is, is, is going to be challenging across the board. It may not feel as much, but you're going to have customers who are going to be interfacing with your systems, and you're going to have internal changes in your team. And then the final one is 
there is this risk that we can't really figure out right now, which is systematic cascades, what happens when you get these AI systems playing off against each other, um, and what will happen to the risks that get built at that point, right? I mean, if you're running a balance sheet and you've got an end-of-day VAR, um, it's, it's probably not following some kind of Gaussian, because there might be some sort of extreme systemic risk you have to think about, which is challenging. Great. So thank you. Um, you can follow me on Twitter and all those things. Yes.